You're listening to Tim Bulkley's Five Minute Bible. There are some Bible passages you just wish weren't there. That chunk at the end of Ezra, for example, where Ezra organises for them to get rid of their foreign wives. That passage always leaves a bad taste in my mouth, especially having heard from African colleagues about missionaries of the past who made polygamous men get rid of their second wife, and the wives were left helpless and homeless. Yeah, that's one story I'd like to get rid of, or at least tone it down. Or maybe even read against the grain. That's what a PhD candidate for whose thesis I'm co-supervisor is going to do. Read that story against the grain. He'll imagine the voices of the wives and their children. But his approach always raises questions for me about where his values come from. You see, the way he argues it, this passage is not one that liberates and therefore it's one that we read against the grain of the Bible. But where does this value of liberation come from? How come that's the standard, the canon, we can use to measure the Bible? And indeed, what does liberation mean? And why is it so important? Where do our values come from? The Founding Fathers of the United States did it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, they said. Self-evident is fine until someone, or some group, else, says, Not to me they're not. Where do values come from? From religion? Well, how do we know what the values of our religion are? We know because of the texts, and because of authoritative interpretation of the texts. And so here there's a tension right at the heart of the Reformation Revolution, at least the way my community told it. It was the Pope, the magisterium of the church against the Bible. But for those issued from the Anabaptist tradition, we want to be without any magisterium. The Bible, we say, makes sense of itself. So, Mino Simons, one of the best known of the Anabaptists, said, You say we are inexpert, unlearned, and know not the scriptures. I reply, the word is plain and needs no interpretation, namely, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and thy neighbour as thyself. Matthew 22, 37, 39 Again, you shall give bread to the hungry and entertain the needy. Isaiah 58, 7 The Bible interprets itself. And it does, if you make two other moves that they usually made. The first move is to privilege the meta-narrative of the Bible the big story we sometimes call it nowadays. Once you do that, several other things follow. One of those is that you privilege the place of Jesus and his teaching, because for a Christian Jesus is the heart and core of the meta-narrative, the big story of the Bible. And you admit that some texts are more equal than others. Your picture of the Bible is no longer of a flat, flat plain but a lively countryside with hills and valleys, high points and low points, and all of it centers on Jesus and is judged by Jesus. The second move that they usually made was to take notice of the role of the Spirit in interpreting the Bible, though they were not, of course, individualistic, though they were often individual. So Hans Denk, another of the great leaders, said, whoever honors Scripture and is cold towards divine love, should take heed that it does not make an idol of Scripture. Scripture without love is nothing. And then, of course, the Bible, if it's to interpret itself, must be coherent. The bits must fit with other Scripture, fit with the big story, and fit with Jesus. So, if Ezra and the treatment of foreign wives doesn't fit with Jesus, can you imagine Jesus? ordering people to divorce their wives, doesn't fit with the big story of the God whose love reaches out to us in Jesus, and doesn't fit with other scripture about a God who hates divorce, as Malachi puts it, a God who made us for each other, as Genesis 1 and 2 puts it. If that happens, then you have to do something more complicated with the story of Ezra. At the very least, you have to see it as being one of the valleys, one of the low points in the story of Scripture. 
all of which records the interplay of God and his people, and all of which serves to teach us, to provide us something we can learn from, but not always directly, not always by a neat moral of the story. Thank goodness.